What is a world war? In my opinion, a world war is a conflict that involved multiple great powers and completely changed the political landscape and the future. Although this term is usually given to the periods of 1914 to 1918 and 1939 to 1945, there are many other conflicts that would apply. The Napoleonic and Seven Years' War are both candidates, but a conflict that is often overlooked that completely redefined history was the byzantine sassanid War of 602 to 628 and its aftermath. This war was the culmination of 700 years of rivalry between two great powers and ended the ancient world. The weakening of the Romans and Sassanids led to the Romans being reduced to a shadow of their former self, and the Sassanids being conquered outright. The people responsible, the Arabs, started a completely new and different era of history, the Islamic Golden Age, whose kingdoms and empires would redefine the political landscape, create the second largest religion with almost 2 billion followers, and create advancements in mathematics and science. Just for clarification, the term Persian describes any of the two empires that inhabited Mesopotamia and modern-day Iran. This could be applied to either the Parthians or the Sassanids. The Sassanids overthrew the Parthians in 224 AD. Similarly, the term Byzantine will be used interchangeably with Roman. The Byzantines were the Romans, under a new label put on by future historians who differentiate the empire during the Middle Ages. Anyways, the Roman-Persian War stretched all the way back to 52 BC under Crassus' invasion of the Parthian Empire. These wars would happen every few years, with invasions and counter-invasions being the norm. However, there were a few notable trends in these wars. The first trend was marked by complete Roman domination. Persian advances were limited to Antioch, with Roman counter-offenses often sacking the capital city, Ctesiphon. During Rome's Golden Age, Ctesiphon was sacked three times in a single century. However, as Rome declined and the Sassanids replaced the Parthians with a more centralized and efficient bureaucracy, they became a more even match. As the Western Roman Empire fell, barbarian invasions of the Balkans became more common, and subsequently so did the Roman Sassanid Wars. Most wars followed an almost copy-paste style of a squabble over a borderland, a Sassanid invasion that was stopped, a Roman counterattack that was stopped, and a peace treaty that returned the borders to before the war. But a common trend that encompasses every single Roman-Persian war is that they did not expand to invasions of the heartlands of either empire, with Anatolia, Egypt, the Levant, and Central Persia being blood-free. Land that was gained was retrieved, and the border remained a bloody stalemate. Extremely optimistic treaties were signed, with the Treaty of Eternal Peace lasting a pitiful 8 years. If Augustus, the first emperor, was transported 600 years into the future to the empire under Emperor Morus, he would recognize the borders. The next Roman-Persian War happened during the reign of Emperor Morus in the year 590. Prince Khosra II, who was deposed, came to Constantinople and asked for help in retaking the throne. Morris, seeing an opportunity, helped out Khosra. The campaign succeeded, and Khosra was put in place as the emperor, willingly ceded lands in northern Mesopotamia as thanks. The first 11 years of Khosra's reign were marked with peace with Rome, as Khosra's gratitude towards Morris and Roman satisfaction with the gains made created no opportunities for conflict. This peace was not to last. Going back to Constantinople, Morris's reign was a successful one. His predecessor's reigns were marked with incursions by the Avars, a nomadic group who was to play a large role in the upcoming conflict. Taking advantage of the stable eastern front, Morus pushed the Avars out of the imperial lands and ravaged their lands beyond the Danube. This, however, led to a strain on the empire's treasury as troops' wages were cut. This led to the revolt of Phocas. Phocas revolted and killed off Morus and his heirs, and became emperor. He was universally described as a tyrant, but more importantly, it provided a golden opportunity for Khosrau. After hearing the news of Morris' death, Khosra invaded the Roman Empire, under the pretext to avenge his benefactor, and the byzantine sassanid War of 602-628 begins. To counter the invasion, Phocas transferred troops from the Western Front, allowing the Avars to slip back into the Balkans. Meanwhile, in the East, following the format of earlier Roman-Persian wars, the Sassanids made original successes, taking the important border fortress of Dara. But as the Sassanids invaded from the east, another threat emerged for Phocas's regime, the revolt of the Heracli. The Heracli were a distinguished family that governed North Africa. Heraclius the Elder, the patriarch of the family, and his supporters revolted, evading Egypt from his base in North Africa. This drew troops down from the eastern front, weakening it further. The Avars and Slavs took this opportunity to invade the empire, as troops were moved from the west to the east. Meanwhile, Heraclius the Elder's son, the Heraclius, sailed to Constantinople with an army and killed Phocas. Heraclius was proclaimed emperor, assuming the leadership of an empire that was financially ruined and invaded on both sides. 
His revolt also extended the byzantine sassanid War. Phocas had quite a good chance to force the Sassanids into a settlement, as the Romans in the last 700 years had done. But with Heraclius' revolt presenting civil instability and the withdrawal of troops from the eastern frontiers, Khosrau made advances and decided to continue the war. As Heraclius assumed power, the Sassanids advanced in Armenia and Anatolia, conquering Caesarea and seeing a raiding party reach Chalcedon. After advancing on Syria, Heraclius assumed an army to defend Antioch and failed. Antioch, the third largest city in the empire, was sacked by the Sassanids, splitting the empire in half. Sassanid forces then split up, with one army marching south, conquering Jerusalem and Damascus, and another army marching north, attempting to conquer the rest of Anatolia. Sassanid advances in the south were extremely successful, eventually conquering Alexandria and the rest of Egypt. This was a disastrous blow to the Roman Empire, as Egypt, the breadbasket of the empire which had not seen an enemy army for almost 600 years, fell into Sassanid hands. As the Sassanids finished their conquest of Egypt, and its Ancyra fell, solidifying the Sassanid position in Anatolia, Khosrau sent a letter to Heraclius. Khosrau, greatest of gods and master of the earth, to Heraclius, his vile and insensate slave, why do you still refuse to submit to our rule and call yourself a king? Have I not destroyed the Greeks? You say that you trust in your god, why has he not delivered out of my hand Caesarea, Jerusalem, and Alexandria? And shall I not also destroy Constantinople? But I will pardon your faults if you submit to me, and come hither with your wife and children, and I will give you lands, vineyards, and olive groves, and look upon you with a kindly aspect. Do not deceive yourself with vain hope in that Christ, who is not able to save himself from the Jews, who killed him by nailing him to a cross. Even if you take refuge in the depths of the sea, I will stretch out my hand and take you, whether you will or no." Coins were printed with Deus Aduta Romanus, or May God Help the Romans, as Roman desperation grew. Rhodes was taken in 622, threatening a naval assault on Constantinople. As the Avars invaded from the Danube and conquered most of the Balkans, the once mighty Roman Empire was reduced to Constantinople, North Africa, and scattered pockets and islands in Greece and Italy. To any normal observer, it would seem that Rome had finally collapsed after 1400 years of existence. But faithfully following the ancient Roman tradition of never surrendering, Roman luck began to improve as Heraclius, despite his disastrous first decade, proved to be a capable administrator and commander. He increased taxation, forced loans on the wealthy, and melted church gold to provide for his counteroffensive. He consolidated all remaining Roman forces into a single army and marched on Sassanid forces in Anatolia. He delivered a crushing blow to the forces, pushing the Sassanids out. Heraclius then proceeded to raid deep into Persian territory, sacking the Persian city of Gonzak. These actions prompted Khosrau to organize a final attempt to defeat Rome, an attack on its capital, Constantinople. A force of both Avars and Sassanids marched on the city, and with Heraclius far away in Armenia with all the troops in the empire, it was left to the garrison to defend. Constantinople's triple walls withstood the siege, establishing naval supremacy, preventing the Sassanids from crossing the Bosphorus. Both armies were repelled. After these victories, Heraclius established a diplomatic connection with the Khazars, known more commonly as the Goat Turks. Taking advantage of Sassanid weaknesses, the Goat Turks began raiding the borderlands and gave Heraclius 40,000 troops. Heraclius then decided on a daring winter raid into the heartlands of Persia, forcing Persian armies to regroup to defend their capital. The last Byzantine army and the last Persian army met outside of the ruins of Nineveh, who, sacked by the Persians more than a thousand years ago, began Persian domination of Mesopotamia. Heraclius outmaneuvered and defeated the Persians, plundering the cities outside of Ctesiphon. Khosrau refused to surrender and was assassinated by the remaining army. A peace treaty was signed, returning the borders back to before the war started. But more importantly, the Christian artifacts that were stolen from Jerusalem were also returned, including the True Cross. The scene of Emperor Heraclius triumphantly carrying the true cross back to Jerusalem would dot churches and monasteries throughout the Middle Ages, showing the triumph of Christianity. The Persians fell into civil strife, seeing eleven emperors rise and fall in three years, while Heraclius celebrated his victory. If he had died right there, Heraclius would have gone down as the most successful Roman emperor ever, saving the empire from the brink of collapse within six years of uninterrupted complete victories. But that was not to be. Although the war was long and devastating, it still resulted in the status quo peace treaty that the Persians and Romans loved so much. But with the teachings of Muhammad and the unification of the Arabian Peninsula, a new religion, Islam, was born. 
Under the brilliancy of Khalid ibn al-Walid, the Arabs decisively defeated the Romans at Yarmouk. This led to Heraclius retreating once again to Anatolia. The 26 years of conflict with the Sassanids and loss of the eastern provinces to them turned out to just be a prelude to the Arab invasions, as the devastation and loss of manpower wrought on the provinces made them easily susceptible to being conquered again. The Arabs swept through the Levant, Egypt, and Syria, reminiscent of the Persians decades ago. However, this time, the conquests would last. Mesopotamia and Persia would fall as well, as the Sassanid Empire disintegrated in a decade. North Africa fell, and the Slavs and Avars once again invaded from the Danube. The Roman Empire was once again reduced to Constantinople, Anatolia, and scattered pockets and islands in Greece and Italy. Unlike the Sassanids, however, the Romans survived thanks to the impenetrable walls of Constantinople and a complete overhaul of the administrative system. Heraclius fell into despair as he watched the East fall once again, his decades of reconquest and victory being reversed to one province at a time. His successors did not fare better as his dynasty ended with the disastrous Twenty Years' Anarchy, a period where seven emperors ascended and were deposed in 22 years. The Roman Empire that would emerge from this rapid loss of territory and civil war would be radically different than the previous, and would never fully retake its territory in the east. These radical changes in the world alongside the devastation of cities and land marked the end of antiquity. The hegemony of Greco-Roman and Persian culture in the east would be replaced, and never rise again. Although this conflict happened over a thousand years ago, the aftermath and rise of Islam were felt throughout the world. The spread of Islam led to the creation of a vast empire that stretched from Spain to India, spreading Islam as far as Southeast Asia. The rich tradition of art, literature, and science that was created and flourished during the Islamic Golden Age lives to this day, as Islam remains the second largest religion with almost 2 billion followers, shaping our current world.